I am Professor Selena Busby from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, uh, where I am the course leader for um, Applied Theatre. So I work with community groups in the UK and beyond, looking at how theatre can invite people to think about making a change of some sort. Hello, uh, my name's Andy Barrett. I run a community theatre company in Nottingham called Excavate. And we work with communities generally of place, but not always. Um, across the region to dig into and find ways to share stories about culture, history, challenges, aspirations and identity. So my name is Antonia Liguori and I'm a senior lecturer in applied storytelling. Um, I'm part of the Storytelling Academy at Loughborough University and my main expertise is in digital storytelling. And I've been working on a variety of projects globally uh, trying to co-design, expand the conventional model that we apply in workshops, the digital storytelling California model. And, uh, and therefore, I'm here to learn from Celine and Andy how we can expand this model and make it work for the Jambi network. So, so I think it's great we had an opportunity to spend some time together in Leicester a few weeks ago and helped by Karen, we've been able to actually create this great visual representation of our thoughts which probably we could use today as a guide to, to to express what we believe could be a way of running the workshops in India. So Selina would you like to to start and kick off this? this? I guess we really started to think about who we were making the workshops for, what they were about and the really practical things of of breaking it down into manageable sections. So uh, we, as I watch it moving along with it, we ended the, the day coming up with three, roughly three workshops that could be delivered to various different groups within India. Um, but getting there was a, was a really uh, roundabout discussion of how we all work and what we all felt was important about it. So it was a real combination of different disciplines and different ways of working. Um, and I confess, I'm not really sure where to start to unpick that. It, I'm not sure if, if, if linear, linearly across the diagram is the best way to do it or, or whether, there's, whether, we should, whether we should start with a specific uh, theme and explore that. Um, Antonio, yeah. what, do you, what do you think? Where should we start? I think, yeah, I think even this challenge is actually summarising what uh, we had to experience when we were even starting to think about this mm. process. And I remember when Andy arrived, actually, you know, there is this little guy that is creating a palette uh, at the bottom left corner. Yeah. I think that was our first conversation that actually one of the responses to those challenges were actually thinking about something that is adaptable. Yeah. And therefore we came with these four keywords of voices, opportunities, context, needs, and challenges. So probably we could start from- And I was late. So I missed that discussion. When I, when I arrived, the palette was already there. So- Can, um, can I just add, add to that about the palette? I mean, I think what was interesting was when we, when we started, we weren't exactly sure what would be most useful to the facilitators in India. So at that stage with the palette, it was about creating a kind of um, uh, a range of uh, suggestions and, and ideas and approaches that could be picked at, you know, at random, if you like, depending on the context that the facilitator was working in. But after then speaking to the facilitator, I, I think that the palette um, although it, it works, it, we, we kind of actually ended up saying, well, it will be helpful to devise a kind of uh, a more specifically detailed process, which is what I think we did. Yeah. Um, and it was very much about working with one group of people, knowing that those people will change, that the, uh, we'll begin with one group, the second group will be, um, will lose half the people and the other half will bring some friends with them. And then hoping that by the third uh, week, we will have retained most of those people. Uh, and that it was fundamentally about finding ways for people to share their stories and to feel comfortable with each other. I think that was the kind of the, the main focus of, of this. 
Yeah, that that's great. But it's also a great starting point for any discussion around how to co-design a workshop in a context in which probably we are not familiar with the kind of target audience. So I think the the key questions we were asking ourselves before even talking with the local facilitators were quite relevant to them as well, because in theory, they could think about what they are trying to achieve and therefore adapt the model that we are suggesting here, depending on how things are going to change in the different locations. So, so and I really like actually, um, you know, Andy, when we were talking about voice, you know, the voice of each individual, but then the plurality of those voices. And therefore, this is a sort of thread that we have maintained even when we were designing the process, because then we were thinking about how to make those voices heard or how to make, make sense of silence or, you know what I mean? It's like, even if we, if the palette has been not the focus of the design of the three key workshops, but in a way, it stays there as a, as a starting point, we can go back and actually be inspired by and because I think that understanding the needs of these individuals who would be involved is always something like is a is something to keep in mind across the three workshops, of course. Uh, and also another thing I really loved of the conversation we had when you arrived, Selena, was actually about how adaptable the process should be. Yeah. And you know, so yeah, if I you think, want to say a bit more about that, yeah, I, 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 it, it made me think about it again actually when you were just talking it, it, it is the adaptableness or the flexibility of it, it it is really important I think a lot of what what we've what we've distilled sort of is is three sets of workshops with some outlines of, of suggestions of of what we might do in those situations but the difficult thing for us to capture is is what actually happens in the moment we'll, uh, uh, and the exercises that we might do if we were delivering this type of workshop would really change depending on what was happening in the room so it, it, it's a lot of a lot of the facilitation that I, that I do and I, I suspect that Andy does too and actually Antonia as well is that you react to what's happening in the room and you change your plan quite distinctly because of things that are moving so I, I think that that would that would be the the one of the key things I'd want to say is that that the output or the work and the output is a set of workshops but that that they're not set in stone at all they're they're suggestions and guidelines of things that we think that work for us that might work in this context but but, but the people on the ground the facilitator delivering it is the person who will know what it feels like in the room so that adaptability for me is is really fundamental so although we've come up with like a, a a toolkit maybe or a box of tools to use it, they're really each of those is really flexible and adaptable and you might want to throw them all out or bring in new things and that's really okay I, I guess that's the most important thing for me is that it, it, that flexibility is fundamental to the way that we work and it's really hard to capture that when you're trying to to, to give somebody else a, a, a sense of how to work and yeah. just to add to that um all of these uh, suggestions and all of these things that we would suddenly think oh let's try this are ultimately just about trying to encourage and find ways for people to share their stories yeah. to, talk, to talk to each other to talk to us to feel safe in that feel able to expand on whatever they're talking about and that therefore it's not like the facilitation needs to feel as though it's having to mimic or copy or replicate or get drama exercises right yeah. Because they are the means to an end. And therefore, if in the facilitation, the facilitator felt uncertain about certain activities, rather than trying to replicate those, if they thought just having a cup of tea and talking would get more information um, and, and they would feel more comfortable with that, that that's fine. We're not so, you know, trying to say, you know, here's some things that you must model yeah. in exactly the way that we, that we think. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember we also had um, quite a um, uh, lengthy and deep conversation to think about the space. I mean, you can see here this reversed face on our on our drawings, uh, the space, the safe space, a closed space and the integration. So if you want to say a bit more about what we define by space, is this a room or is this, you know, the kind of characteristics of interactions that we want to facilitate? 
where to start with space. It's such a huge topic in applied theatre. That's uh, so what you call it, how you how you use it, the safe space. It's it's a, a, a real ongoing dialogue in the in that in the discipline all of the time. I think some of the things that we said about space was that it needed to be, it didn't matter where the space was, but in it, but it needs to be safe safe in the, in the in the sense that people are comfortable in it to, to share things so the closed space is about n not letting well we talked about it being a woman only space if we want women to really talk to each other and share their stories and so it's sort of closed in as much as people can't wander in and out of it or through it necessarily and um that specifically because it's such a short amount of time to be working with people the long-term goal would obviously be to be combining gendered spaces but in this instance to start off that it feels like it's uh, more useful to start with women and explore the question that comes straight underneath that um, space diagram actually what does it feel like to be a woman in India now that if it's closed to, to, to women and in a space that's um, secure in some sense of the word then we're more likely to get women genuinely sharing stories about what that feels like and that that seems to be fundamental to to the whole process to me. Uh, and one of the things that we may not have discussed, but, but thinking about this again, it's partly about what you, what leaves that space. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's partly about the, the idea of the space as a kind of set of rules that are decided upon by the participants. You know, what remains in the room? So that people, because although other people aren't in the room, the knowledge, the stories can leak out. Yeah. So I think that's something to be aware of, you know, the kind of group feeling that they have constructed their own um, uh, rules, if you like, uh, of, of what happens with this material, what, what yeah. you know, because that, that will impact on potentially on, on what people are willing to say. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, you were mentioning this uh, question here, what does it feel like to be a woman in India, which was for us was actually something we came uh, as, as, a, as a sort of final thought, even if it's here as a, as a, as a hook, as a key message to, to start with, because actually we had conversation also about how problematic the name of the project is to actually trigger uh, conversations and create this safe space. So that gender violence is not, even if that is the name of the network, probably is not the right way in uh, to start conversations and actually this key question you just mentioned what does it feel like to be a woman in India is probably the best way for the local facilitators to start having those conversations would you agree completely I, I would I would completely agree agree with that and I, I think it, I think what we said on the on the day when we were creating the the, the workshops and the picture is that that once you start that, that once you start with a question as as open as what does it feel like to be a woman, um, the, the the conversation will probably quite quickly lead to um, uh, gender based violence and resilience um, as a natural part of a of, of a conversation. I, it's, I think if you start with it, you're more likely to to silence people because it becomes a big issue. Whereas if you start with a more gentle approach, using um, some of the playful games that we'll talk about later, um, you actually get to quite deep stuff very quickly. Um, and then you're also inviting people to share things that they feel comfortable sharing and that, that they might not all want to leap straight into those difficult, deep conversations. Um, but it still gives them a way into conversations and sharing because it's a, a more, it's not really a neutral question, but it's a, it, it's a gentle question that could lead to interesting places. And, and again, the other thing with that is there is the opportunity for that kind of shared um, knowledge and shared experience, which people find perhaps uh, people feel more able to laugh at and, and enjoy the fact that other people feel like this, because maybe it's not as threatening or it's at the very bottom end of a spectrum of power that ends up being very um, problematic. But, yeah. but in that moment, it allows uh, the kind of laughter and the shared experience that helps to kind of bond the, the group, which is which is very important ultimately, you know, for these kind of conversations. Yeah, yeah. 
Sorry, I, I was just as I completely agree that that, that, that that humor and joyfulness is actually how you get to the to the to the more difficult stuff. If you come in with with the the, the playfulness and the joy and the humor, then that, then you're right, absolutely right, Andy. That the, the space feels, for want of a better word, safer, and that and stories and sharing will happen on a more uh, on a deeper level than if you just start with a with a huge topic I think I think you're absolutely right about humor I think it's really important and when we talk about our work it's easy to leave that out because you don't feel it in the room when when you're talking about it in this way you're not in the room which feels so joyful and uh, it's a really interesting uh conflict that 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 the work feels so serious when you talk about it like this when you're actually doing it it's it's not serious a lot of the time it's very playful and very joyful and and, and laughter is, is the biggest tool, most useful tool that you, that you can use in, in a workshop like this, I would think. Yeah, and actually, and this is the essence of, you know, the, why we are using applied theatre and storytelling within this particular, you know, research project, which I think is, uh, is adding, um, you know, this kind of aspect that if we were using like social sciences approaches, probably we were not able to actually achieve. So actually something more around the space is that we are trying to create a creative space, a space for creativity for everyone, where actually those sentiments, those feelings are freely expressed. And uh, so there was something, so we said in the end, when we were somehow defining a structure for these three workshops, we said we we hope to run three workshops in two locations. And ideally they should be consecutive or one per week. And we were thinking that each of those workshops should last three hours. Uh, actually two hours of activities with some time for you know sharing food and sharing you know informal conversations and having you know uh, again a free space for them to connect so how do you see the first week I see here we say the first week actually is to get to know each other so how do you see this first week actually to be uh, you know the starting point of these creative workshops I think you need to talk about that a little bit, Antonia, because the first one is the most traditional. I, I thought I might be remembering this wrong, but I, we sort of talked about starting with some some gentle games. But I think we talked about this as being the, the your storytelling circle week. And so the heart of this one, the, the, there's some playful games and things before we get to that. But the heart of this one is is more your territory than it is ours, I think. Well, Andy crosses over, obviously, between storytelling and um, applied theatre, definitely. But I think this I think this one was your idea, Antonia. Yeah, we we, we created, we co-created ideas. I, say, I think this was the starting point. I mean, when we talk about digital storytelling, we, we tend to think of a, of a five-step process and we tend to start with what we would call a story circle uh, to then move in the, in the next sessions. And actually... The following weeks are somehow um, an expansion and adaptation, and uh, as, let's say the applied theatre and storytelling are more interconnected, interlinked. Probably in the first week, uh, you are right. It's more like a, an introduction to the process with a, a more conventional story circle, in which we would ask uh, each participant to actually start framing ideas for a story they would like to to develop in the following weeks. And usually in a story circle, we allow each participant, we facilitate conversations, we, we allow time and space for them to actually start sharing. Um, sometimes we use an object, sometimes we use a photograph. In this case, we don't know it's, uh, as we said, it's the facilitator's choice to see what is best. Sometimes we provide prompts, but I think the key question, the key question we were exploring in the beginning about how does it feel like to be a woman in India could be actually the main, the core theme of the story circle. And each of them would be asked to share a key moment, a key experience uh, in their daily life in, as an example of what they want to share with the rest of the group. And uh, the beauty of the story circle is actually the, the active role of the listeners. And there's also an opportunity to create mutual support because the facilitators should invite each participant to ask questions, to expand, to clarify, and also to support the storyteller in thinking about the audience, who is, who is the audience they're going to share their story with. And the primary audience is, of course, the other people in the room, but also thinking about why this story 
uh, could actually create connections within their group and could uh, somehow create messages, key messages, important messages for to expand that primary audience. And therefore, what is what story we are going to tell for whom to express what? Is this story meaningful to me? Is this story meaningful to other people? And have those con conversations about the relevance of that story for us as individuals, but also the importance of that story within a particular community as well. So it's a, it's a way of framing ideas, creating connections and facilitating mutual support and mutual learning, I would say. So, and uh, what I like to say and to see in this kind of story circle is always that the role of the facilitators, it, it disappears so that we are able to create such a strong connection uh, within the group that actually the facilitator just needs to keep an eye on time and make sure that they're all interacting and having the, a conversation and having enough time uh, to share the story. Something we discussed is also that sometimes there are people who are not ready to share their story. So something to keep in mind as a facilitator is also to make sure that uh, we do that in a way that is not stressful and therefore that people who don't want to share their story, they don't feel ready to share a story, they're still involved in the process. So the active listening, being an active listener is as important as being a storyteller. Um, we have the eggs, the ice breaking. Uh, and I was trying to think, oh, what, what things are we thinking of? Because I think those ice breaking activities that lead into the uh, story circle are important. And unless I'm wrong, I think one of them, because the, the ice breaking activities, uh, the aim of these is to help create a sense of a group uh, quickly um, in a way that isn't demanding of people or puts people on the spot. And I think one of the games that we suggested which I think you said, Celine, was called the sun always shining. <laughs> I think no, I, it's called different things in different places, but that's what I've heard it called most often. Yeah. yeah, and it's a nice game because it's basically a group of people sitting down in a circle in chairs, for instance, and then somebody says um, something like, you know, uh, I have a cat. Uh, and then everybody that has a cat has to swap chairs. Um, and, and it's a way in which people begin to learn about each other uh, and also their similarities. Um, and then you can you can move that you, you can move that into I believe or I think. So so you can go from being really gentle uh, and exploring people's similarities uh, and then but you can get deeper and deeper. You know, I believe that, um, you know, women should have one day a week where they, you know, where, where they get to rule the universe, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. So that's quite, that is quite a nice ice-breaking game that might be useful uh, leading into a story circle. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we said icebreakers are essential <laughs> every, every week as a, as a starting point and they should somehow uh, be a way of you know, as we said, also because we are not sure if the people are participating each week are the same for the next week. So it's um, uh, we need to recreate the group every time we meet them somehow. So we need to create that kind of um, connections and intimacy every time we start a new week. So, yeah. and Sorry, Antonio, I was just going to say that that is something that we can do alongside this. You know, we, we can put together a kind of document of, of some warm-up games because the other thing about warm-up games is the word warm-up you know that, well ice breaking and warm-up you know uh, it's to get the energy going a, a bit as well and for people to have fun yeah. so sometimes they can be quite silly little things um but but they just they they just kind of create a playful atmosphere so so we can we can uh, put together a kind of uh, a document that, that lists ideas that we have yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a wide, wide selection of icebreakers. But again, we also had a conversation about making those icebreakers culturally relevant. So I think that the facilitators could also play around those as templates and uh, and recreate something that they believe is more uh, appealing, interesting, relevant uh, to the to the local um, 
participants. The other thing we said actually is actually to have food uh, at the beginning of each week or during the day, whenever is appropriate, uh, because sometimes conversations that happen while sharing food, they are also a, an important, meaningful way of connecting with each other as well. Uh, and, the, and again, I remember for uh, the facilitators, we were saying that uh, as top tips, of course, they should be part of the process. They're not just there to dictate what to do, but they are an integral part of the actions. And sometimes they could even start sharing their own story uh, to make sure that they, they somehow we need to show our own vulnerability to make sure that the other ones, they feel comfortable in being vulnerable in a group. And the other thing we said that we might also suggest having an, a second facilitator is acting more as a timekeeper, as an observer, making sure that social dynamics are, you know, that the flow of the conversation is fluid and uh, making sure that they can read the body language if there is tension or, or happiness and how to expand happiness and reduce tension somehow. Yeah. It, just to um, pick up on that as well, you know, I think again, that with the, with an observer, their their potential role is that they can be making notes of what's being said, and again that but that needs to be something that is discussed, you know, with with the group about you know what what's uh, what do people expect? Because again, if people are sharing things, that question of how is this being recorded, Absolutely. what's happening to my words, is very very important. So that needs to be something that is that is understood by everybody and agreed by everybody. Yeah. I just that is, that's really important. I'm just going to go back slightly and um, actually use something that you just said, Antonia, about when you're doing the story circle that the facilitator becomes almost invisible. That they're, they're part of the process. They're not the, the group. The circle facilitates itself to some extent. It's the same with the icebreakers. I would say is that you're as a facilitator, you're definitely suggesting things and walking across the circle and changing chairs for example when it when it affects you and in exactly the same way you at times in those games you can be you should be completely invisible um and and being a timekeeper rather than anything else and uh, but i'd also go back to one of the other top tips we've got there about um uh where is the one i'm looking up let the participants stop and think. I think the temptation is, um, we talk about silence being valuable just under that. I think the temptation even in icebreakers is to rush things along, particularly if you're new to this or you're working with a new group, is that silence sometimes feels quite um, threatening as a facilitator but it's actually really useful the more I'm not saying leave a participant leave the participants to think for like 20 minutes but in a game like that once it's picked up its momentum sometimes pauses are really valuable to let people stop and think about what they want to say and, and what they want to play with in that space and so my my other th in that top tips I just wanted to highlight that taking your time and not rushing through any of these exercises is re is a really valuable thing to do yeah, absolutely. Timekeeping is not a rigid activity, actually, and goes back to the space when we were talking about the spaces, this, you know, always uh, being constantly uh, aware of the space and feeling the space, feeling the emotions and uh, and finding the right pace for, for that particular group. So, so very often in the story cycle, we say, OK, we got five minutes each and now we'll keep an eye, <laughs> you know, and then we look at our you know the time is clicking and uh, and this beautiful story we want to stop it because the time but it's not that the case is actually and this is why as we were saying actually we are all involved in the process and we are there to listen to empathize to respond expand and uh, and allow time for you know taking in the intensity of the stories as well so for the second week uh, I see as a as a key message there is this idea of visualizing. So where is this coming from? I think our thinking was was to move away from um, having to think of people needing to tell their stories personally directly through their own voice. And being able to abstract it a little bit, um, just to provide another another way, another resource, another approach to try and um, draw stories uh, out out from the group. 
So we were thinking in that case, let's let's try using some image theatre exercises. Um, image theatre, this kind of work is is very established kind of applied theatre practice, very Bawalian. Um, you know, it's it's stuff they're readily available to to look at the kind of different kind of games and exercises uh, you may use. So it, it's it's something that, that's reasonably common. It, 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 it's relatively simple to do. You know, like anything, it can get more and more complex and more sophisticated. Um, so that yeah, that 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 was that was our thinking to to have another language and another language of gathering stories. That's great. That actually goes back, you know, when we were talking about the um, conventional digital storytelling process, I would actually think of digital storytelling uh, as a transition, as an opportunity to transition through different languages. And therefore, I see the story circle as an opportunity to share our ideas through the verbal language. And then I would move into, you know, the audio recording and video editing as a transition, you know, to a sort of performative language. And then the visual language combined in a video with again the listening and the, the role of the listener the viewer the the people are in the space as a, as active as possible uh, being this I think a sort of exercise of co-creation as well so just to recap so we said first week story cycle we always start with with an icebreaker and we provide a list of potential games and icebreakers the prompt for the story cycle is actually the, the key question of the of the three weeks that is about uh, what does it feel like to be a woman in India. For the second week, we identified another key prompt that is about think of think of a story or think of a time where you were not heard, where you were not being heard. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I see here, actually, back to the ice breaking activity that we identified one in particular. Can you describe it? I can't. Andy, I think this was your one. I can't. Well, I... It, it kind of, it came about partly because of this. Yes, I agree. Yeah, it came about from, from our interest in, in cultural um, movements connected to the idea of yes and no yes and no and how you can be saying one thing but with your body revealing another thing yeah. um and i think unless i'm wrong that that we were gonna ask a series of questions and we thought this was a would be a very playful um uh, activity and then ask the women to kind of uh, if if they were having to kind of uh, convey that, you know, say one thing with their <laughs> words and another thing with their bodies, um, how they would do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and then to kind of, when we said scaling your gesture, I think we were going from the kind of the, the subtlest kind of small movement up to the kind of the largest. Um, it, it was an idea that, you know, I don't think, and I, I've never done it. I don't know if you've <laughs> <laughs> so we were kind of inventing a new game. It's um, a good one, though. I love it. <laughs> because, yes, because when you get to the larger scale, you're you're not you're not in. It's really useful, I think, because you're not in the reality. The reality is the yes, but the, the, the how you're sh what you're feeling inside with the with the larger scale <laughs> body gesture can be really funny and really outrageous because you you every part of your body is screaming no, but your mouth is saying yes, okay, I'll do that, and you could really play with that. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how we as a three <laughs> came up with that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna use it a lot. I think because it, it's really useful and. And it takes us really nicely into people using their bodies more for because bodies as well uh, images of bodies are kind of key to that week too and it's a really gentle and playful way into that so i uh, it, it i think it's a good one we should all go and, away and test it this week yeah and also it's about code as well and it's about secret code so again it's like this kind of set of a secret language yeah. that we that us women we share we know what we mean yeah. um and they still don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why can't they see what we're telling them with our bodies? You know. Exactly. So, so again, it brings a joy and a kind of sense of sisterhood, you know, um, which is really useful. Again, in that, in just in that sense of kind of people willing to share more when they when they feel uh, stronger together, kind of thing. Yeah, completely. 
and it links and it links beautifully with the with the main question of that week of think of a time when you're not being heard or when you couldn't speak that's exactly what's happening in that exercise so it's it's nice it's lovely it is it is and actually week three is a sort of celebration of this resilience so it's let's say that these three weeks they are they are independent weeks so if there are people are participating just one of the three they will get something out of each individual week but the ones who will be able to actually participate to the three weeks they will get this sort of journey shared journey with a with a sort of celebration of that resilience both as an individual and as a as a group at the end and uh, i think yeah you were saying something uh, Andy. well i was just going to say um, i didn't know whether you were going to like move us into week three but but i was just going to ask selena if you don't mind sorry selena because i know you've done this more than i have if you if you could yeah briefly kind of just explain uh, a kind of an idea of the image work because i know we were saying this thing moving from a negative into a positive you know and that that classic kind of you know how we, yeah. how we might transition yeah absolutely and uh, and again it's something that we can uh, i can write formally as a sort of instructions to be played with they're not fixed in stone again but so if if you get people in a small group of i don't know three or uh, five or six is probably a good number to each think of a, a, an example of when they weren't being listened to or when they couldn't speak or when they felt that they weren't being heard or they, they couldn't say what they wanted to to share those in small groups and then between them pick one of those examples from from the group that they could all uh, that resonates with them all um, and create a uh, a, a tableau a frozen image or, or, or the equivalent of a photograph using bodies so they can show what happened in that situation how they felt and who they were talking to so people physically in a in the equivalent of a photograph but with real people show that without speaking um and then as a, and, and, and then show those to the rest of the group and have a, the group have a whole discussion about what they recognize in each of those, what they what they notice about them um, and, and, and how the, and how they feel about those um, still images and then put them back into the same group so that then they think about what would what would happen if they had been heard or they could speak in that situation, what what the reaction might be or, or how they might feel having done that. So you kind of get a a pre and post image if that makes sense um which you can then be shown and then you can ask them to i, I tend to do it in three three very distinct separate stages with people who aren't used to using their bodies in this sort of way so that so that you're scaffolding it quite carefully so you've got the two extremes not being heard and then being heard um and then you you get them to transition between the two so how do they physically move from the not being heard to the heard um it, even though they might not be particularly realistic situations it's thinking about the resilience of how you move from a position where or who you might share with rather than the person that you couldn't share with or a whole variety of different things depending on the circumstances but they physically move between the two and then you show all of those and talk about those as a whole group and again talk about what you recognized and what you didn't recognize and the the the, the the physical body thing is is usually um, quite funny. People will um, they, they like they like to they like to make those images and uh, and there's joy in the room when they do that, even though the topic might be quite difficult. But where the real work happens is probably in the, the whole group discussion of who recognised what, what did that feel like, what could be changed, how could things be different, um, and that starts to move us into stage three or the workshop three, which is about resilience. I think that's that's what we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, we were not explicit in saying that at the end of each of those weeks, we would uh, see like a reflective moment for, for them to actually reflect on the process and what they enjoyed, what made them, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I think that, that would be a, another important time to spend as a group, let's say, at the end of each week to actually reflect on how those different activities had them frame stories or ideas or express feelings around these key questions we are trying to to explore together and again the third the third week uh it's um it's uh, somehow inspired by one of the steps of the digital storytelling process very often we use storyboards but storyboards are usually applied as a as a preparation to then work on the video editing in this case we are using a storyboard in template actually to facilitate the story listening process. So we would like um, participants to work in pairs. One would act as a storyteller, the other one as a story listener, but also capturing the story 
in a storyboard and template to then help unfold, develop, visualize the key aspects of this story that is a story to reveal the individuals and the uh, resilience. And we have identified four key blocks, key pillars of these stories that they can um, uh, represent visually by drawing and also add a few key words in the storyboard and template, starting exploring the context of that story, understanding a particular and explaining a particular challenge, and then identifying as, a, as they are working in pairs, a solution, so a core solution, we call that, and that is actually a story about the future. So they might use as a conclusion of their story, as an endpoint, something that didn't happen yet, hasn't happened yet, but could happen in the future. So it's about working together to even think about something that happened that was challenging, but finding together as a group, as a pair, a solution that could be actually a, a good message, a key message, a takeaway message for, for the other people. And then after this uh, exercise in pairs, they would report back to the whole group and they would, they would all reflect on those different, let's say, scenarios that have been co-creating about a story about that potential uh, better future, let's say, potential solutions identified uh, to somehow respond to challenging situations. Great. I think that that was, uh, let's say, the the end of our thinking process. Is there anything else you want to add? Just, just a little thing about this idea of revealing resilience and connecting it to and what if you are being heard. I think if I remember, we were talking about that that idea of how when you do talk about and explore those moments when you did feel as though you were heard when you felt as though you did have power, because we, throughout this, you know, we, we, we were saying this is, part, this is about power, ultimately. Um, and it's partly about how through sharing these stories, we learn what people used, what they needed to help them be resilient. What were the resources they drew on? And therefore, what can we learn about the resources that people need to enable them to be to have power themselves. Um, so I, I think there was something around that, that that interested me when we were talking. Yeah, very much so. E even if they can't change the situation, how do they live within it and and have a sense of power in some shape, way, or form? It's, I think it's, I think that's really important. That's great. Thank you, both. Just to summarize. The key message that actually Karen brilliantly, brilliantly captured, I think what we've been trying to do here is to offer a template that is not a template, we don't like templates, but is to offer some sort of inspiration to actually design something that is absolutely owned uh, uh, by the facilitators, the local communities. So this is just a, a, a starting point. Uh, with some key questions to sort of facilitate those conversations. But actually, what we read here at the very top, um, providing a deeper insight to conversation through creativity, I think is the is the key ambition of this type of creative exercise we've done together. <laughs>